genealogy friends and welcome to family tree notebooks tv in the car because that's how we roll uh happy valentine's day it's the valentine's day edition which is kind of fun we haven't had a holiday edition yet so yay valentine's day i'm actually not a huge valentine's day person i feel like there are other holidays that i get more excited about valentine's day is not one of them but i wanted to do some valentine's day theming so we're going to be talking about uh, secret relationships because we're going to be talking about finding your ancestors who were uh, LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus, and how can you tell if any of your ancestors fit that description? And then we're going to be talking about breaking up with genealogy systems that are no longer serving you, how to handle breakups gracefully. Uh, but first, some news. There should be a lot of news because I was, I didn't do a lot of news last year or last year. Last week, uh, I don't have that much news though. SLIG Academy for Professionals is going on right now. Um, I actually opted out of it. I'm on the SLIG committee, for those of you who don't know, but I've got the new course that's coming out um, where enrollment opens on March 1st, and I just felt like I wanted to give the new course all of my attention, so I didn't do SLIG Academy this year. Um, but orientation has already happened, and from what I hear, it's going really well. It's actually the last year that's gonna be called SLIG Academy for Professionals, we're switching it to be called um, SLIG Spring Virtual. Right now there's a SLIG Fall Virtual already, and then this is gonna be SLIG Spring Virtual so that we can have more classes that are not just designed for people who are like in the field of genealogy. Um, but also I think people hear Academy for Professionals and they think that it's like, you have to know all the things before you can take these classes, which again, if you knew it, you wouldn't be taking the classes. But anyway, this is our last SLIG Academy for Professionals, but that's because in 2024, it's going to be SLIG Spring Virtual. Uh, Roots Tech, of course, is coming up really fast. I finally downloaded the app. The app is available. And I found out, um, so I've told you guys before that if you're in person, then you buy a ticket. If you're virtual, you just have to register and it's free. So the, the Roots Tech app, first I was confused about it too because I got the Roots Tech app, I downloaded it, and then it wouldn't let me sign in. I was trying to sign in with my family search login, and that's not what it wants. It wants you to create like a a sign in just for the app. So it there's a thing where it says, you know, you can either log in or you can set up a free profile. You're gonna set up a free profile. Um it took me more than a day to figure out that that's what they wanted. And then once you do that, you're just in. You don't have to say like, you don't have to prove that you bought a ticket or anything like that. So anybody can get the app and get into it. The thing that um, is key about that is that you can see the sessions. You open up the session description and a lot of the sessions have handouts. You can see the handout in the app. Now you can't download the app, or at least it's not like readily apparent to me that you can download the app really easily, which makes sense because people... Um, pay for that. Like we buy flash drives with all of the uh, handouts on it, but you can see them. So you can go on, even if you're not going to Roots Tech right now, look at all the sessions. And if you've got a session that you're interested in, you can click on it and see if there's a handout and you can like read through the notes and stuff. I think that's gold and it's free to everybody right now. So um, go and check that out. Uh, last bit of news, finding your roots tonight. I'm like so excited. I'm such a nerd. Finding your roots tonight is, um, what's his name? Richard, uh, Richard Kind, the I always think of him as the voice of Bing Bong from Inside Out, but he's also, he was on Mad About You, and he's famous. You'll know who he is when you see him. And David Duchovny, and yes, I'm a David Duchovny fan. I was the perfect age to be into X-Files when it was all the rage. Um, I'm quite the X-Files nerd. I'm quite the Finding Your Roots nerd. I am very excited about tonight, so... We're gonna end our news on a happy note because tonight I will be spending my Valentine's Day with Dr. Henry Lewis Gates and David Duchovny and my husband. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to stabilize the phone more. I feel like I've been really shaky today. I have um, it's a medical condition that causes tremors in my hands and I'm shakier this week than I think I normally am. I have a tripod that I can use to record things like this. I just always forget to bring it. So I'm sorry for all the shaking. And I think the video might look a little bit different, but that's because I'm now using the sun visor to stabilize myself. Um, okay, so let's talk about our top five, quick five tips or whatever for the week. Uh, I wanted to talk about how do you figure out if your ancestors were LGBTQ, if the reason that they 
you know, you look at their records and you're like, oh, they were, they were alone their whole lives. They were never married. Is it a maiden aunt? You know, did your uncle have a series of roommates? Was this a close friendship or is this a relationship that was not um, socially acceptable? Maybe not legal. So therefore there aren't the kind of records that we expect to see when we're talking about people who are in a couplehood, you know, where we see marriage records or divorce records or people are listed on censuses as being husband and wife. It's a lot harder when you're talking about a relationship that may have been the same kind of relationship, but um, socially it needed to be masked in a different way. So we're going to do five quick tips. Um, so the number one way to find out if your ancestor was uh, part of the LGBTQ community is to look at their personal effects, their correspondence, diaries, things that they have written in scrapbooks or on photos. Those are going to be your best clue because they're the most personal. And some people were very open in their own correspondence and their own things about their lifestyle and their um, relationships and the re people that were important to them. And some people, it may be a little more hidden. I will just tell you, you have to remember that you always have to look th at things through the, the lens of historical context. So not only in the sense of, okay, you know, let's read between the lines and, oh, I think they were secretly in love, but sometimes people are very affectionate with each other in words or in photographs and things like that. And it's not because it was a romantic connection. It was just because socially it was acceptable to show that kind of affection between people. Um, so, you know, don't, don't jump to conclusions, but check out personal correspondence first. That's kind of an obvious one though. I feel like if you have a personal piece of correspondence that says that they are having a romantic relationship with somebody of the same sex, um, yeah, that's a pretty big clue. <laughs> In which case my five top tips, that's, you don't need my help. You've, you've already got your answer. So my second tip would be to look for, um, it's kind of sad, but you would want to look for records of crime. Uh, and so you'd be looking at court records or you'd be looking in the newspaper because the newspapers did print things like that. If you have an ancestor who at some point was accused or was convicted of any of the anti-same sex laws, so uh, convicted of sodomy, convicted of, um, or accused of public indecency or having a lewd relationship with somebody or things like that. Even if that relationship doesn't have to do with the person that you're suspecting was the other half of this romantic relationship that was kept in secret, it's an indication that there was something going on with your ancestor's lifestyle and then it, it's more support. It's, it lends more support to the fact that they were having um, a same-sex relationship but that it just wasn't open. Don't forget, if you have somebody that you're suspecting was the object of affection for your ancestor look for court records or for newspaper articles naming that person as well and naming them, you know, across their nicknames and things like that. Because again, even if your ancestor doesn't have anything, if the person that you're suspecting that they were in a same-sex relationship with has something like that, then that's just more evidence that at some point in history, that person was at least considered um, somebody who possibly had same-sex relationships. So it's just a little more evidence, um, if that makes sense. Uh, the third one, the third tip that I would say, look at if your ancestors, well, I'm assuming your ancestors deceased. Don't do this for living people. If you want enough living people are in same-sex relationships, ask them. And if they won't tell you, it's none of your business and leave them alone. So let's just assume that your ancestor is deceased. Look at their estate papers. Look at wills, you know, probate records, and look for places where they were named as being the beneficiary of somebody else's estate and somebody else's will. Um... It's possible people leave things to their friends and wills, but again, that's a big, if somebody leaves everything to somebody who is a friend, somebody who was a long time roommate, that's an indication that that relationship was very important to that person. And maybe it was very important to them in a romantic way. So again, it's another piece of evidence. Do not only look for records that, um, were created and executed, you know, in the middle of their life, look for end of life records. Uh, as far as records that were created in the middle of their life, look for habitation records. When you've got people listed on the census as being at the same address for a long time, you can have people who are landlord tenants, people who are boarders. You know, this is where you've got two female friends, neither of them ever married, and they lived together for 40 years. Possible that it was a completely non-romantic companionship situation. 
also very possible that that was a same sex relationship, then they weren't allowed to be publicly married or to say, you know, this is my um, partner, my romantic partner. Uh, sometimes I think that people actually err in the wrong way because it's such a foreign idea that the ancestor might have been part of the LGBTQ community. Um, it's pretty common. It's a lot more common, I think, sometimes than people think. So it's a definite possibility. So don't, don't close your mind off to that possibility. Uh, in addition to the census records, look for people who share the same address listed in directories and things like that. Again, if you've got somebody that you suspect, somebody that's in a lot of photos or there's correspondence or they were left, you know, money in an estate or something, look them up in the city directory. It may not always be obvious that two people are living at the same address if their last names are nowhere near each other. So they're not listed in the same, on the same page in the directory. But if they're both living at the same address for years and years and years, it's another big hint. Um, now, I will say my number five tip is actually, it sort of is the opposite of proving love. It's like disproving love. Sometimes there are historical context explanations for things where, um, sorry, I need to move my hands a little bit, where you think, oh, well, this is an obvious clue, but what you're missing is that they were in a profession where being unmarried was the norm. They were in, you know, I mean, a very obvious one is that if you've got a member of the clergy and you're like, oh, he spent his whole life living with men and he was never married. Yes. There's a very obvious reason for that that doesn't have anything to do with that person's sexual orientation. Um, not to say that, you know, their sexual orientation could have gone either way, but like there's a very obvious separate reason. Women who were teachers were actually often expected to be unmarried and to stay single. And you could have, you know, in a, a school situation, you can have teachers who both work at a school who are living together, but that's because socially they were expected to do that until they got married and if they never get married well then who knows um uh so drawing from personal experience my great-grandmother I had suspicions about whether or not she was actually in a romantic relationship with somebody else who's in our family who she would have been related to through marriage because after the death of their husbands they spent the rest of their lives living with or next door to each other. Their lives were completely intertwined. Um, there was lots of correspondence. There were lots of photos of them together being affectionate and things like that. And then I found these scrapbooks where they had pictures and they had like, there was pictures of one with like a heart, you know, that they had turned taken a photograph and cut the heart of where the person's face was in it. Um, and then they were buried next to each other and not next to their husbands. And all of that, you like add that together and you think, okay, we've obviously got this same sex relationship that was covert. The thing is when you talk to, or when I talk to my ancestors, my ancestors, my relatives who knew them, um, and who were able to obviously then speak with a lot more authority on them than I do, because both of these women were people who died before I was born. There were explanations for lots of it. For one, they were childhood friends. They literally grew up together in an orphanage. And it turned out that the heart-shaped pictures, not only could they have just been in lockets and been the like, you know, when you have your very best friend in the world, especially in an orphan situation. But I think some of the hearts that were cut out, they'd actually cut out hearts of their own heads. <laughs> it's just the scrapbooks got scrambled where it's like, instead of having hearts of each other's heads, they just had hearts of their own heads, which I think is kind of cute. Very um, teenage girl thing to do. They... Financially, there were lots of reasons for them to stay living together and to raise their kids the way they did. It was easier to raise them all together once. Well, yeah, once husbands were dead because that beat just trying to do a single parent. There were reasons for them not wanting to have romantic relationships with other people. And their husbands died at very different times. I think that because they died close to each other, it was like a two for one situation in the cemetery where they, they, they bought a burial location and then said, okay, well, I'll probably need the other one in about 10 years. So I'm going to hang on to it. These are all reasonable explanations and nobody in my family, when I have brought up, you know, do you think it was a same sex relationship across the board? Everybody's like, no, it definitely wasn't. You're up in the night. You're nuts. Will we ever know for sure? It's really hard to do that. That's a very private thing. People were very private and they were very private about same-sex attraction because think about the social ramifications when it was illegal or just, you know, socially looked down upon. I think even now it can be hard for people. A hundred years ago, it was impossible, especially in certain communities. Um, so they could go an entire life and never write something down or never, you know what I mean? We just don't know, but all we can do is look at the clues and do the best we can 
Um, so those are my top five tips for that. Okay, and then I'm gonna finish the video talking about breaking up with your genealogy system because, and I'm gonna kinda, I'm not gonna rush through it, but my hands are really starting to hurt and I feel like my shakiness has just been terrible. I promise that I'm going to look for my tripod um, probably when I get home today because this has been ridiculous. So breaking up, let's talk about breakups. Breaking up in this sense, when you're talking about breaking up with a genealogy system, I don't just mean breaking up with ancestry or with family search, although don't feel like you have to be married to those services either. I'm talking about when you put so much time and effort into organizing your genealogy in one way and it's not working out. 1000% have been there. Um, for a really long time, I was a, a pile of manila folders type person or boxes. I had a box for each, you know, family tree and I would know, okay, well, this goes with this person. So I'm going to toss it into this box and I've got these giant folders and some of the folders kind of had stuff together about one person or one family, but everything was all mixed up. And I did that for a long time. It was easy to break up with that system because it was a system that wasn't really working. I constantly felt like I didn't know what I was doing and that I couldn't find things and things were getting messed up. So I decided that I was going to make a file for each person and I was going to have these beautiful files that were all uniform and I would just pull out the box of files for each family tree and it was all going to be lovely. And I went to the container store and I spent, ooh, I don't know, it was it was a sharp expense. I most remember it was a sharp expense because I couldn't afford it at the time. I want to say it was like $400, which again, I don't know what I was doing at the container store. I love the container store, but I don't go to the container store unless I'm ready to bleed money. Uh, I, but I was like, I love my family history. I, this is really important to me. I'm going to do a great job. So I bought expensive file, hanging files. I bought expensive tabs. I bought expensive document protectors. I bought expensive everything. I got this whole system. And I started to sort stuff and almost immediately it started to not work out because what do I do with group photos where there's more than one person? What do I do with this document? What do I do with the bazillion documents that weren't the right size to put in a hanging file folder? What about when I hung everything in the hanging file folders and then some stuff was kind of getting bent and stuff at the bottom because it really didn't want to be hung up? And what about the newspaper that was starting to acid stain the things that it was next to? I think I knew that the relationship with that organization system wasn't working out a week after I had done it. I didn't break up with that organization system for two years because I had put so much money into it and because I really couldn't see where else, what else I could do. So I stuck with it and I sacrificed time and I sacrificed documents and I sacrificed the fact that I still couldn't find anything. Now it was just taking up more space in my house and I couldn't find anything. And I had, I still had all of my old boxes because I had all the stuff that didn't fit in the hanging file fold. It was just bad. So eventually I broke up with it and I came up with a new system and I did something different. And that new system, it wasn't immediate, but eventually it turned into family tree notebooks and obviously changed my life. Um, not just because it became a business, but because it became the genealogy system that was meant for me. And I regret how long it took me, but I, I think I was so into it. It was the Vegas thing. I had put down so much money and time that I wasn't willing to walk away from the table. But the thing was, I was never going to win with that system. It wasn't meant for me. Any of us who've had a relationship where eventually you break up and you just think, I can't believe it took me so long to break up with that person. Uh, and it makes space in your life for new romances that serve you so much better. Um, yeah, there's freedom in it. There's freedom and power in it, but it's scary when you're doing it. So I wanted to do some tips for if you're in a place where you've got a genealogy system, you've had it for a long time. It doesn't really work, but you don't know what to do and you don't want to waste the time and the money that you've spent setting it up. This is where it comes into like you've printed all the stuff out or you've got binders and they're all on the shelf, but now like that's not really working and 1000% have been there. So um, my number one tip is to keep your eye on the goal. Think about what it is that you really want to accomplish. If what you really want to accomplish isn't making that particular system work. It's just having a family history system that works for you, that helps you with your research into something that you can pass on. You need to let go. Like if the win isn't actually, oh, look at how well she stuck to this system for all those years, um, you need to let it go. And you need to let it go with the idea that money and time that has gone into it, it's a sunk cost. It is what it is, which is sort of my second tip. Everything's a learning experience. 
you never waste time or money if you're learning something. Um, the only time that you really waste that is when you double down. Once you've learned the lesson, <laughs> expecting the lesson to change. That's kind of a waste. But you can't look backwards. You can't look backwards and say, oh, but I spent all this money and I I don't know. I once painted uh, uh, my bedroom gold after my husband said that it wasn't a good idea. Because I thought for sure once it was up, it would be great. We had it up for like eight months. It was miserable. It was awful. It was ugly and shiny and uh, it made you really stressed out when you walked into the room. And yeah, I could have repainted it immediately, but I wanted to like, one, I wanted to be right. And two, I was sure that because I had spent so much time and money that at any minute it was going to be great. Even though the second it went up on the wall, it was a bad idea. It was a bad gold. If you're wondering, if you're thinking, oh, I think a gold wall sounds nice. Yeah, so did I. This was not it. This was not... No, this was very bad. This was, I turned our bedroom into cheap jewelry. Anyways, um, another tip is as you start moving into a new system or experimenting with potential new partners, potential new systems, new ideas for organization, celebrate every single win you've got because that'll make you feel better and it'll move your brain away from thinking about like these imaginary losses that you imagine that you have because your other system didn't work out. So the next time you find something, the next time you've got to organize something or file something and you know right where to put it and you put it there and it's done, just make sure that you recognize those moments because they counterbalance the other ones. Um, make sure that you don't have to get rid of everything if you've got an organization system that doesn't serve you. Um, so you can keep the parts that you like, but make sure that you're keeping them only if they're truly serving you and they're moving you closer to that future goal. Because again, I don't want you to trick yourself into keeping something because you think, oh, I like that so I can keep that. But low key, it's because you spent money on it and you're just kind of, you're not sure how to fix it, but it's not really working for you. So keep the stuff you love that serves you. Other than that, you got to let it go. And then finally, I mean, I think this is true with any breakup. Part of getting through a breakup is to find people who support you as you move forward onto bigger and better things. Um, in this case, it would be finding people who can give you ideas about how to solve the problems that you've got and how to change things in the future or people who are using a different system that you're interested in. Um, I mean, again, this is all like this light plug, for, obviously for Family Tree Notebooks, but only because that's where I ended up. So if you were going in that direction, then the community of people who are using Family Tree Notebooks pages are going to be helpful to you. But there's also this great Facebook group called um, Organized Genealogy, Genealogy Organized. I think it's Organized Genealogy, Organized Genealogist. I get all sorts of tips from that group and that group is great about problem solving people who are having organization struggles. Nobody is going to tear you down for having a failed relationship with an organizational system. They're just going to help you keep your eye on the prize and move forward with your head up and treat everything as a learning experience. And those are the people that you want to have in your life because those are the people that make you survive breakups. Okay, well, that was about it. My hands are shaky. I got to go. But I just wanted to wish you a happy Valentine's Day. Thank you for spending the time with me. And I will see you next week.